He was a lion in battle. He was a servant of God. He was the father of his nation. He guided his people into the modern world. His name was Abdul Aziz. In 1901, 60 armed men set out in secret across the desert. They were led by Abdul Aziz bin Abdul Rahman Al Saud. His aim was to capture Riyadh and unify the country. It was, he felt, his destiny. He was 26 years old. Ten years before, Abdul Aziz and his family had left Riyadh and gone into exile. Now his target was the Rashidi governor Ajlan's headquarters, the Mazmak fort in the middle of Riyadh. Ajlan slept there each night for protection. Leaving most of his followers outside, Abdul Aziz crept into the town with just a few companions. This was his second attempt to take the fort. Six months before, he had besieged it for four months. Concealed in the house opposite, Abdul Aziz and his men waited for sunrise when Ajlan would leave the fort to go home. At last, Ajlan's horses were brought out. <laughs> Abdul Aziz attacked Ajlan, who fled into the fort and Bin Jilui killed him inside. With just 40 men, Abdul Aziz had defeated twice that number, captured the fort, and regained Riyadh. The Al Saud had returned. It was January 1902. When Abdul Aziz fought Ajlan and won, the people of Riyadh accepted him. When his victory was declared at the top of Mazmak, they said, We have heard and obey. The people of Riyadh were forced to have bin Rashid as their ruler. They didn't want him. Abdul Aziz's victory meant the return of a dynasty which had dominated the heart of Arabia for long years before. More than 200 years ago, the Al Saud held court here in Diriyah, the capital of the first Saudi state. Here they patronized a religious reformer, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Their reform movement revolutionized Arabia.
The movement was based on an absolute commitment to the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. The Al Saud rulers were called Imam by their people. We're not calling for a new creed, and Mohammed bin Abdul Wahhab brought nothing new. Our creed is the creed of our Muslim forefathers. في ذلك الزمن كان هناك في الجزيرة العربية شبه انفلات. At that time, the people of Arabia were somewhat loose in their Islamic beliefs. There were many blemishes, customs and traditions that were added to Islam, as you may find in other religions. These additions were done away with in accordance with Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Wahhab's teachings, which were, in fact, truly Islamic. And from this teaching, the state of Diria started, and it started and expanded, and one of its main goals was to purify the faith and to unify the land. And the proof for this is that when it unified the Arabian Peninsula, it went out to Iraq, Syria, and Al-Arish to unify the Arabian lands. But by 1891, the second Saudi state, which had dominated most of Arabia for decades, had dissolved in dispute and civil strife. The Imam Abdul Rahman bin Saud and his family left Riyadh and went into exile. His son Abdul Aziz went with him, with the hope he would return. They first took refuge with the Bedouin tribes in the empty quarter. Abdul Aziz was just 16 years old. After seven months in the desert, Abdul Aziz and his family moved to Kuwait, awaiting an opportunity to return to Riyadh. He saw at first hand the forces that would shape the future of Arabia, and he learned about the international politics of the day. To the north, the dominant power was the Ottoman Empire, with its capital in Istanbul. For centuries, the Ottoman sultans had considered themselves caliphs of the faithful Muslim community. As such, they had traditionally played an important role in Arabia. But in the Arabian Gulf, there was another power, that of the British Empire. The British were increasing their influence in the Gulf. This was the situation when Abdul Aziz made his attack on Riyadh. In the mosques of the little towns of the Riyadh district, the word went out that the Al Saud had returned, and with them, the fierce commitment to Sharia law and Islamic values. واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا يا أيها المسلمون إن من فضل الله عز وجل على هذه البلاد أن جمع كلمة أهلها على التوحيد وإقامة شريعتها السمحة وذلك بفضل الله عز وجل ثم بفضل عبد العزيز يعني في تلك الأيام People in those days saw in Abdul Aziz their values and their manners. They saw in Abdul Aziz their hopes and wishes and expectations, and that's why they followed him willingly, because they were very religious people too. Abdul Aziz and his father began to reach out to the tribes and emirs who controlled the oases. One by one, they fell in behind him, and in 1903, Abdul Aziz felt strong enough to unify the lands, moving northwest into Qasim. Allahu 
I saw him praying on a sand dune. Later on, I sat across from him, and we ate from his lunch. Ibn Nagail brought his food and milk, and all of us, the hungry ones, sat and ate. He said to us, with good health. It's true, we ate his lunch. After a drawn battle at Bukharia, Abdulaziz set out to attack at Shinana. The Al Rashid was supported by Turkish troops with artillery, but Abdul Aziz was undeterred. We, the young ones, ate his lunch. Then he just jumped on his horse and started to strike out at them in all directions. He did not find bin Rashid because he just started the battle and fled. Abdul Aziz struck them on all sides until he was victorious. We, the young ones, ran after him. The scene turned to ashes, and Bin Rashid ran away. The victory had been won, and Abdul Aziz added Qasim to his lands. The Ottomans resorted to negotiations with Abdul Aziz. Turkish garrisons were later withdrawn from Qasim. In Arabia at that time, it was not enough for a ruler to control the towns. Outside in the desert were the Bedouin tribes, leading a nomadic life, preying on the townsfolk and each other. Their raids and counter-raids led to blood feuds and instability. To ensure security, Abdul Aziz had to enforce Islamic law between the tribes and the townsfolk. In bringing about security, force was not enough. To settle the tribes, Abdul Aziz tried a revolutionary new policy. He enlisted the power of Islam. He sent preachers to the tribes who urged them to settle down in fixed communities or hijar around the wells and the mosques, made up of different tribes devoted to farming, not war. He called upon them and sent people asking them to believe in God and his messenger. He provided them with the books on faith written by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He called them to be citizens and supplied them with ammunition to fight the enemies of God and his messenger. If they did not become one entity, he said, Satan would make them fight one another. The movement took hold. The tribes returned enthusiastically to Islamic faith and styled themselves Ikhwan. Eventually, there were more than 200 settlements. It was a significant social change. Abdul Aziz's rule at this time extended only over the center of Arabia. But now his reputation for security and reliance on Islamic practice was to bring rewards elsewhere in al hassa to the east.
Al-Hasa was a vast oasis, rich in dates, and it had at one time been under the Al-Saud. Now it was ruled by the Ottoman Turks, but they were unable to control the violence of the tribes who surrounded the oasis. The Turkish authorities were, were making deals with Bedouin gangs to divide the spoils they looted. At that time, local figures saw there was, there was no way out of this crisis except to contact King Abdul Aziz. The religious leaders in al Hassa had had close contacts with Riyadh for years. So in 1912, they sent a letter to Abdul Aziz inviting him to come to al Hassa. Abdul Aziz was afraid the British might replace the Turks in Al Hassa. So, having tricked the tribes who surrounded Al Hassa to move off to the north, Abdul Aziz set off with 900 men. Abdul Aziz sent his people ahead according to his plan to climb the walls of Hafuf and take positions inside the town. From the side of the western wall of Al Kut, they prepared a special hole for his entrance. They erected ladders for him in the bottom of the trench, which he, he climbed and entered through this hole. He was received by the people of the town who gave him their allegiance. And the Ottoman soldiers were scared and they started firing recklessly in the air. In the morning, the Turkish governor tried to use force. Eventually, the Turks surrendered. The agreement was reached between King Abdul Aziz and the Turkish governor, Ahmed Nadim, who surrendered his authority and left with his 1,200 soldiers and military honor intact. Victory in the east soon followed. Once the ruler of a landlocked state, Abdul Aziz now had access to the sea, with all the wealth and contacts of overseas trade. Abdul Aziz had taken Al Hassa at a crucial moment. Britain and the Turks were about to go to war. British needed to prevent Abdul Aziz from further conquest in the Gulf. They signed a treaty with him in 1915, and the next year he went to Basra for talks to avoid being drawn into the war. The relationship between Abdul Aziz and Britain was very clear, with no grey areas. He addressed them frankly on the things he felt were right, and presented policies that showed both experience and sound judgment. So the British felt at ease dealing with him. They knew he was a wise man, and they should not make any trouble with him. By the end of the war, Turkish power in the Arab world was destroyed. So the British and their allies imposed a new settlement on the territories they now dominated. They recognized Sharif Hussein in a kingdom of the Hejaz, and with their help, 
two of his sons would become kings of Transjordan and Iraq. Abdul Aziz was hemmed in, but he put the enthusiasm and religious devotion of his soldiers to work, continuing the unification of the country. In 1919, Abdul Aziz took over the sovereignty in Asiya. And then he settled matters with Hail. He laid siege to the town, and then, after two months, he tightened his grip. Our King Abdelaziz spent so many years sending him messages, asking them for reconciliation, trying to come to a mutual understanding. Of